two convex shapes in 2D or 3D and we look for an axis along which the projections or which the projections this is the projection of the first one and this is the projection of the second one do not intersect all right if you can find just one such axis then you can absolutely certainly declare that the two convex shapes do not intersect on the other hand if you cannot find a single separating axis then it means that the two shapes do indeed collide okay they are in contact all right now to reduce the number of axes that we have to test because we cannot really test for all possible infinite axes we decided to try and find a way to determine uh, just the set of interesting axes and the set of interesting axes for convex polygons in 2D just 2D, for 3D there is a bit of a catch as usual uh, we pick the normals of every one of the polygons All right. so we pick the normal that is the separating axis. We project on the separating axis. We see the two, the two, uh, the, the two uh, projections, and we see if they intersect. Right? Okay. So this is a rather straightforward test. But what does this mean? Uh, this means that for every normal that belongs to the first, the first shape normals, we get the interval. <coughs> we get interval 2 and then we see if they intersect, right? So getting the first interval requires checking all the vertices of the first polygon, right? And getting the second interval requires the same. And this is wasteful because really if we're talking about the first shape then do we really need to check all these vertices here? Do we need old vertices? So we've picked this normal. This is the normal of this particular face. Okay. Do we need to find the whole interval for that shape? We can just take this point here, take just the projection of the face itself, so the projection of either of these two vertices, and it doesn't change which one we pick. And we see if this point here is outside the interval given by the other polygon, right? So you don't you don't care about this one. Who cares? Uh, you don't need the whole interval. So what this means is that we can already make this test much smarter just by finding the projection of this point here. All right? So for for every normal belonging to the normals, well, or actually for every face belonging to the faces of the first shape, we get the normal of the face, we get just one vertex, we can call it P, F dot vertices of zero, all right, and then we check the projection of all the vertices of the second shape against P, projecting <coughs> on the normal N. Okay? And we can do this by saying for every vertex of the second shape, if the vertex <coughs> minus P dot product with N is greater than zero, oh sorry, if the my apologies if the minimum for all the vertices belonging to S2 dot vertices of V minus P dot N is greater than zero, then we have a separating axis. After all the tests, then we have a collision. So after we've done all the tests. Is this clear? So, we take the difference between this vert every vertex, this is going to be the minimum, between every vertex and just one of these. And we project this difference. So what we get is the offset from the projection of this point 
and the projection of the face. So when we do the dot product between a vertex minus the reference point in the face with the normal, what we're simply getting is how long is this distance. And it's positive if we're on the other side or if it, or it's going to be negative if we're behind the face, right? And we stop as soon as we find a vertex that is, for example, here. So if this vertex was on this side of the normal, then indeed this would not be a separating axis, right? So we try to, uh, so the idea is that we pick this as the, as the origin, as the reference point. Sorry. And we only check these deltas. So with all the projections, we just check the deltas, okay? This, and we do the same for all the faces of, of, of the second shape as well. How much faster is this variation compared to the naive one. The naive one takes <coughs> every normal and then computes two intervals. So how many computations do we do with the naive version? <coughs> oh no, don't, don't count on, on that one. So you know that you have a number of faces, so you have the number of faces of the first shape have the number of faces of the second shape, we have the number of vertices of the first shape and the number of vertices of the second shape, right? So, for every face of the first shape, you have to check all the vertices to build the interval of the first shape and all the vertices of this one. So F1 times V1 plus V2. For every face, you check all the vertices. And for every face of the other shape, you build both intervals again all right this is very 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 expensive in the new case we are removing the check for we, we don't build the interval we just use a single vertex so we only build the other interval so the resulting cost of this algorithm is f1 times v2 plus f2 times with v1 this is still high but yeah we are we are reducing a, we are still removing a very a very big factor okay so this is our first take and indeed well here's a bit of pseudocode uh, for every normal or for every face you get a single vertex along the face you get the normal along the face which in this case we call d you see if all the vertices of c1 of the other uh, of the other <coughs> polygon are on the positive side of the reference normal uh, of the reference uh, reference space. In that case, you return false. You can immediately say, without testing the remaining faces, that yes, there is not a collision. You have found that the current phase normal is a separating direction. Uh, then you do the same for the other vert for for the other uh, polygon, and only after you've exhausted all the potential separating axes and none of them is a separating axis, then you say, okay, there's no collision. There, there is a collision, right? <coughs> Now, uh, to find out which side you are on, well, yeah, you can, you can do this in plenty of ways. You see if all the vertices are on the positive side or all the vertices are on the negative side. But this, this is very, very straightforward. Uh, what you have to see here is that you still do the dot product between the normal, the current vertex, minus P, which is exactly the same thing we have there. You can reformulate this in tens of manners, and they're all valid. But the underlying idea is always that you, you check the projection of the relative vector that goes from the face to the vertex you're testing against the normal. So you see that which, you, oh, which by the way, as a matter of fact, if this is the normal and this is the reference vertex P, and you take, oh sorry, yeah, P, and you take a vertex V, what's V minus P dot N? The projected distance between P and V, yes, but we can phrase this in an even more intuitive fashion. What is this? It's the length between P and V, because the normal is the same. Uh, Almost, because uh, the length between P and V 
if v is here. Yeah, okay. So yeah, in this case, so consider this case, this case, but also this case here. V minus p dot product n. What is this? This kind of answer should explode um, from you guys. Yes. U and oh sorry. Well, you project v on p. Mm -hmm. Then then it's actually um, always the same distance. Yes. So all of these have the same distance. This is a very good start. Which is the, then the distance between v and no, not p. The thing. Between v and the face, because it may be also just an edge. It is this distance here. As if you extend it, whatever this is, whether it's a face or an edge. So when you take the dot product with n, you are projecting along this line here. Right? So when you do the dot product between, v, so v minus p can be this vector, this vector, or this vector. You take this vec these three vectors, and with the dot product, you project them here. And what you get is the length of the projection. OK? <coughs> Why is this important? Distance between points and triangles, distance between points and plane, distance between uh, points and edges. So this is something that's fundamental. So please draw something like this, hang it over your bed, and look at this every evening before you go to bed. All right? This is fundamental. Do not underestimate how, how something as simple as dot product, uh, how important it is when you, when you do graphics and physics, of course. All right? So when you find something like this, this means that you are taking the distance between this vertex here and the edge defined by this normal and this point. Okay? And you'll find this in plenty of places. All right? Okay, so let's go forward. Now, uh, there are ways to make this even faster. Now, one way to make this faster is to find the interval even sooner. So instead of checking all the vertices, you try to find the vertices, uh, the, the minimum and the maximum of the projected interval, as fast as possible. Now, you can, do, uh, you can sort the vertices. You can use a binary space partitioning tree. You're familiar with, with, with trees space partition trees, etc. So you try to sort the vertices so that instead of having to check them all, you very quickly find the minimum and the maximum. And these algorithms become uh, rather complicated very soon. Uh, another way is to cache something like 100 or a few hundred of possible separating directions. You just cache the minimum and the maximum, the interval. And then when you have a separating direction, you go look in uh, the cached ones, you find the quickest uh, and the, the closest, and you accept that which is akin to projecting uh, the, um, uh, the polygon on a sphere, on a, or on a circle. All right, so the, but there are ways to make this extremely fast. And this is one of the bottlenecks. So this, this collision detection algorithm is precise, so there is not really, and there is not many ways to, to get around the need for having something like this. So, but it is also very heavy. And this is where an engine usually, a physics engine usually spends a lot of its computational time, okay? Uh, well, of course, there's another alternative, which is try to, do, to run this algorithm as little as possible. So try to run uh, the broad phase so that it excludes lots of, of, of these checks by coarser and quicker tests with axis line bounding boxes. So either <coughs> you run the algorithm less or you make the algorithm faster. And making the algorithm faster is doable. There is lots of literature. Uh, but it's also very hard, uh, whereas running the algorithm less is obviously easier because the narrow, uh, the, the broad phase uh, collision detection is, is much more intuitive. But be aware that there is uh, there's plenty of ways to, 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 to solve problems that you will certainly identify during profiling. Now, in 2D, <laughs> we said that the candidate separating axes are just the normals of the edges, all right? But in 3D, the phase normals are as expected, not enough. <coughs> uh, what they do not cover are edge-to-edge -edge collisions. This gives you an idea. Uh, take a look at the faces of the yellow and the blue, uh, and the blue uh, cubes. There is not a single face which normal is a separating axis, right? C can you see this? 
So this one is not because it, it cuts the thing in two. This one is not because because it cuts in two again. This one, yeah, this one here of the blue one clearly isn't as well. This one isn't because it cuts again in two and so on. So this is a very unfortunate case where it can happen, and this is the edge-to-edge -edge collision. So when two edges collide, what you get is that there are no face normals that act as separating axes, all right? And this is, of course, a big issue. Now, let's look at this situation a bit closer. Okay, I'm not that tall, so I'm going to resume this one. So, the edges that are colliding are this one and this one, right? Okay. So, if the edges are colliding, the separating direction, well, how can we find it? How can we find separate the potential separating directions for potentially colliding pairs of edges? Yeah? Taking the normal between the objects? The normal between the objects. Unfortunately, yeah. that never works. Okay. Yeah, but it's intuitively <coughs> very appealing. I, I know the feeling. No, so the separating direction, uh, well, is going to be, well, what's the relationship between the separating direction and the edges? Is it going to be parallel? Is it going to be perpendicular? Is there no relationship? Cross product, the two edges that Why? Would you do the cross product between the two edges? Because it has to be perpendicular to both. <coughs> you need something to separate two edges that are touching. You need something that's perpendicular to both the edges, right? It has to be. It has to be. It has to go against both the edges. If it's parallel, then, well, we know that if it's parallel, it's going to be close enough to one of the faces, and the faces do not separate. So you need something that's perpendicular to both edges. And the only th and when you have two vectors, two edges, and you want another vector that's perpendicular to them, you do. Oh, cross product. Enthusiasm when I say something like this. <laughs> so when you have two edges and you want to find something that's perpendicular to them, you do. Cross product. Cross product. Oh yeah, you do a cross product, of course. <laughs> so, and the idea of the cross product is then uh, that okay, so you have this edge here, the, per the, the vertical one, and you have the other one. Okay, can you roughly see? So this belongs to the blue object, this belongs to the yellow object. What you need is something that is perpendicular, but you, you have plenty of choices. You have infinite choices, right? And among these, you, you also need something that's perpendicular to this one. Uh, and yes, you, you, you probably want well, yeah, something like this, which, which you have, but you have plenty of choices for this one. So basically, the cross product gives us the intersection between the, these two circles of normals, which only contains one, which is probably going to be something like this. Sorry? Two directions. Yeah. Yes, but to get the two directions you have to reverse, revert your the cross product. But both of these are indeed separating directions. But in general a separating direction, even if we negate it, it's still a separating direction. So th this is this is not a this is not a big issue. Okay. So armed with this knowledge so the, the argument doesn't really change. The point is that now you check all the normals of one phase and you get the interval. You check all the normals of the other uh, of the other polygon and you check the interval. Uh, and now you check all the pairs of edges, do their cross products, and do the interval computation. So the argument is, fortunately enough, very very similar, but it just checks more stuff. Oh yeah, this also gives you an idea of why it should be perpendicular to both. All right. So clearly, this vector here. This one here is perpendicular to the edge that, that we don't really see because it goes in. It is clearly perpendicular, right? And this vector here is also perpendicular to this edge here. Then this you can clearly see from the from the 2D drawing. Okay? Alright. And if you can find the gap here, then this is a separating axis. Alright, so what we do now, well, once again, we check all the faces, we compute the intervals. Uh, we check all the other faces, we compute all the intervals, this is the same algorithm as before. And then, for every edge of the first polygon, and for, uh, of the first uh, body, and for every edge of the second body, we do the cross product, this is the potentially separating direction, and now we compute the whole intervals. Or we could just pick a vertex 
on one of the edges and do the smaller algorithm as we did before. But the idea is uh, absolutely the same. All right? Is this clear so far? So with this tiny three, okay, not pages really, but well, how many lines of code is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay, it's, if I'm not wrong, 22 or 23 lines of code. And this is collision detection in 3D. All right? Let's take a moment to, 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 to think about this, because this is perfect. Never, it's never wrong. It works perfectly. It's slow, yes. But this is correct collision detection. And in many games, where you don't really need to do a big <coughs> collision, a collision response, but you need to at least make sure that, I don't know, the bullet has hit the target, all right? then this is also probably going to be enough, all right? So keep it in mind. Oh yeah, and compute the interval, you just compute the minimum and the maximum of the dot product between the normal direction and, and all the vertices. Okay. Now, instead of taking breaks every two hours, no, but this is, this is too soon. Or shall we take a break? Okay, all right. <laughs> Yeah, because there is kind of a change of topic, so I'm always tempted. All right, now, uh, there is one very important addi addition that we might have to make to this algorithm. What if the objects are moving? How many games feature collision detection between objects that are not moving? It's kind of a pointless proposition, right? If they're not moving, then you, you know that the frame zero and it's never going to change. So we do indeed need to make sure that the algorithm we're using is fit for moving objects. Now, uh, if you have objects that are moving slow enough and you can be certain that your frame rate is going to be high enough, then you could just use the other algorithm, which is going to find small interpenetrations, which, is, which could be acceptable in some cases. But if you have objects that are moving very fast, you run the risk of the so-called phenomenon of tunneling. You know what tunneling is? Yeah. It's when you drop to the floor. <laughs> no. Tunneling is when you shoot a very fast projectile mm, yeah. and one frame is here and the next frame is here. Mm -hmm. Right? So this is yeah. Ray casting. Ray casting. Oh my god. Please, please don't never say that. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. We don't do ray casting. Nicely enough, one of the most interesting reasons why uh, uh, the separating axis uh, test is a very good test is that it can be trivially extended to checking moving objects. So we keep the same algorithm, we do a tiny modification, because if you think about it, are we, we are already projecting on a line, right? Now if the object is moving, what shall we do? What do you think we shall do? So we have a moving object, and yeah, go ahead. You only have to uh, move uh, the objective face. Yeah, it's moving. Yeah. Because um, the, if the object is rotating, you have to uh, fix it. And forth, but yeah, let's say we ignore rotation. We yeah. assume that yeah, rotation is moving. You only have to check that face, which already is the maximum and the minimum. And if that distance uh, uh, is at uh, an axis, yeah. So essentially, you know, if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that we just play with the intervals. We adapt the intervals so that they reflect the fact that the object is moving. Now, if the object is moving toward the other one, then the interval is going to be closer to the other object. If the object is moving away, then the interval is going to be moved on the on, on the external side against its target. All right. So this is what we do. We change the projected interval so that it reflects the movement of the object. Uh, now, a very important thing is that we are, from now on, for the foreseeable future, going to ignore rotations. Yeah, you could, in principle, factor rotations in, but then everything becomes absolutely unbearable. And the advantage uh, of having incredibly precise collision detection for extremely fast rotating movement is, well, arguably not an advantage, because then your things become much more expensive just to prevent some, some tiny collisions which you could still solve after collision detection. So what we do is we make a, a deliberate design choice and we say, okay, we accept 
that there is going to be some mistakes, and these mistakes may result in the fact that despite our best collision detection efforts, rotating objects may fall a bit one into another. And when that happens, we'll solve that at collision response time. So the collision response system will make sure that objects that fall a bit into each other, that interpenetrate, are resolved. All right? So this is a very important trade-off <coughs> decision that we're making now. So, we use the moving projection on an axis. So we do the projection considering the fact that it's moving. Uh, but we only consider the relative velocity. Do you remember what relative velocity means? So instead of saying that both objects are moving, we behave as if just one of them is moving and the other one is standing still. So we just compute the difference between their velocities and that is the relative velocity. Okay? It doesn't change absolutely anything, but it does make uh, our notation a bit easier. Now, we know that we have our velocity and we know that we have a potential separating direction. All right? What is V dot product D? So this is D, this is the potential separating axis. And yeah, let's extend it. Let's extend it. <coughs> and this is the velocity. So the velocity is going, let's say, in this direction. All right? Yeah? yeah? It's the amount that the velocity the relative velocity is moving on the separating axis. Exactly. So this is how much the body is moving on this separating axis. All right? And we call this sigma, which stands for speed. Uh, and of course, for this to be true, and this is not sigma one, this is just sigma, for this to be true, for, for sigma to be the velocity on the separating axis, the separating direction has to be long. I don't follow. What, what is the separating axis exactly? This is the direction of a face normal or the cross product between two edges. So where are the two objects? For example, wherever we want. Yeah, okay. But Where do you want them to be? <laughs> I don't know. Let's say one object is here, yeah. other object is here. here, okay? And here we have a face from which we took the separate direction, and the normal of this face is D. Yeah. Or the cro D is the cross product of two edges. Either of these two choices is fine, right? Either this is the 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 the, the, edge, uh, the, the cross product of two edges, or it is the normal of a face. And we want to, we're so what we're doing is we're checking <coughs> if D is a separating direction or not. So what we do then is we project the vertices of the two shapes of the two bodies on separating uh, on the potential separating direction, if, and we see really? if their distance. Shit. Is bigger than zero. It is. They don't overlap, and the objects are not colliding because you can look at them in a way that you can see light passing through them. This is what we're doing. Does anyone does anyone watch soccer? You know uh, the the uh, wait wait a second. How is it called in English? Offside rule, where the defender yeah. Yeah. cannot start in front of the attacker. Okay, you, you look for a separating direction when uh, the guy who's watching the line checks to see if light could pass between between the players. All right? This is the idea. That is exactly the same thing. You have to see a space between them. I don't know if this helps or not. Did you raise your hand? Uh, yeah. Um, the, the separating axis for very fast moving objects, isn't it easier to just put it parallel to the relative velocity between the two? Not necessarily. But that would prevent tunneling very easily because... Uh, but you don't care. Uh, you know, because if they're moving in... Uh, if you check, you, they could still start colliding. So that's the reason why you need to check all the separating axes anyway. Because but if it's very fast, does it matter? If it's very fast, it matters far less. Yes, you could start. Ah, oh, wait a second. For very fast objects, yes, that may be the case. But one word of warning and of caution is pay a lot of attention because many things that seem to be intuitive Often are not. So it's no, much I better. I realize that exactly. There is <laughs> exactly. That so and it may be that. Right. Uh, so you, and you still have to. So you, you're seeing using the a very fast moving velocity as the only separating axis test. Okay, sorry. So you say I have a separating. I want to do 
uh, two objects are moving very fast relative to each other. So I check as the only potential separating axis their velocity, their relative velocity. Um, yeah, and we have a fast moving small object, if you like a bullet or something. Oh yeah, for a, for a very small object that's moving very fast, yeah, absolutely, which then becomes ray casting along the, the velocity direction, yes. Oh, I thought, I thought we don't do ray casting. Yeah, but the, in this case you're just, uh, so the, the, the reduced test, which you okay. can only do for a, very, for a very small object, yes, I'd say it's very safe. Okay. For a bigger object, I'm not so sure. It may be the case, but... Uh. Yeah. Uh. Okay, all right. So, uh, <coughs> now, we know that this is the distance between the be between uh, the two intervals. Now we want to see if this distance is bigger than <coughs> the, 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 the amount of movement during the current frame with the current projected velocity. So we want to know if this is going to be a separating axis during the whole duration, during the whole frame, right? Because it may be that if the objects are moving, then halfway through the frame, they stop being separated, right? So it may be that uh, we're running at, okay, 10 frames per, per second, so we're running at one tenth, so delta time is equal to one tenth of a second. Uh, but after half delta time, so after 0 0.05 seconds, it may be that this object was indeed moving very fast. So imagine the velocity was very big like this. So after half a second, the object is here. So what was a separating axis with the regular test, isn't really a separating axis because it stops being a separating axis halfway through the frame. Is this clear? So the objects along a separating direction, they start separated, but they don't remain separated all the time. Right? We may also get a very evil case where the velocity is so high that they start separated and they end separated. Right? This is, this is a very evil one, but we will catch it. So first of all, how much does an object travel during delta time along the current axis? So, you say velocity times delta time, yeah. of course, but how much along this axis? Yeah? Sigma. Sigma? Times the delta time. Sigma times delta time, yeah. Sigma is just the velocity along this axis. All right? <laughs> so sigma is the velocity, but it's only the interesting part of the, of the velocity. We're excluding the rest of the velocity. We don't really care that the object, if the object is moving in this direction, we don't care. And indeed, it's sigma along this axis, it's going to be zero. Because it doesn't matter for this particular axis. But if it's moving in this direction, well, yeah, it matters now, because it's actually uh, making this, uh, the, the separating direction, uh, the, the, the separation even bigger. So, this, then we could call this delta x, is how much the objects are getting closer or <coughs> further away. Okay? This could have a negative sign. What does it mean when it has a negative sign? Past it. That? Past it. No. What does it mean when the sign is negative? They're moving away from They're moving zone. away. If it's positive, then delta x means that they're getting closer. Whereas if they're ne if it's negative, then it's so this is the negative case. This is the equal to zero case, and this is the greater than zero case. And I'm talking about the dot product, All right? And of course, the dot product is negative, so delta x is going to be negative because delta time is of course uh, a positive quantity. All right? So, oh, and intuitively, what we really care about is the fact that. Yeah, the intervals start with a certain direction, which is bigger than delta x, right? So the, dis the difference between the intervals at the beginning of the frame is bigger than delta x. And if delta x is negative, then this is going to be very easily the case. But if delta x is positive, then we are checking if a collision is going to happen or, um, or if, if indeed there is going to be tunneling. Is this clear? Okay, so let's try to draw this again and maybe and shed a bit more light on the matter.
So we have these two objects, and they start separated along this direction, right? So we know that they have some separation distance. Let's call it SD, which stands for separation distance, okay? We also know that the relative movement is in this direction. This is the relative, the, the, the relative velocity. So this is not moving and this is moving at velocity v. Now we know that our frames are long delta time, uh, and this was the separate in direction d. So we find how much this object is traveling in this direction, and this is sigma, which is equal to v dot product d. All right? So this is how much this object is moving. Uh, sorry, at what velocity the object is moving. And now we, we also find out delta x, which is how much the object moves during the course of the present frame. Okay? Now, if the object is moving a bit, say delta x is equal to less than sd, then it means that after this frame, the object is going to be here. The distance between these the two projections here is delta x. <coughs> Right? So delta x is the distance between uh, the end of this uh, of the projection of the first object after from the beginning to the end of the frame. Okay? Now what do we want delta x to be? So that we can say that this is a separating axis. Greater yeah? density. Smaller than the uh, separating distance. Smaller than the separating distance. So delta x has to be smaller. <coughs> or equal, if you want, then, uh, no, just smaller, much better, smaller than separating distance. Which leaves the philosophical question of when the distance is zero, is there a collision or not, that's kind of relevant for us. Okay? What's the case when delta x is bigger? When delta x is bigger than SD? Yeah. Then they will never right? Sorry? then they won't collide? No, if delta x is bigger than SD, then it means that the separation, the new separation could be something like this. So if this is delta x bigger than SD, then it means that the velocity was very big. And so the new object ends up here. Can you see this? Of course, if delta x is much bigger than SD, when nothing forbids delta x to be something like this, then indeed we have witnessed a potential case of tunneling along this separating direction. All right? And in this case, V was really big. All right? So, one thing is for sure. If you find an axis along which delta x is smaller than the separating direction, then this is a separating axis, and you're done. Otherwise, this is not a separating direction. Now, knowing that this is not a separating direction means nothing. It may simply mean that we pick the wrong separating direction, right? So we do need to check all the other. Uh, we need to check all the other separating directions. So something that we also consider is the fact that. When there is lots of separating axes, and they all fail the test for some reason, for the moving test, we are not certain that the objects are colliding. Because when the objects are moving, it may be that along an axis, you think you have a collision during, for example, the first half of the frame, and you think you have a collision on another axis during the second half of the frame. But if the, all the if the collision times of all the axes do not intersect, then you still do not have a collision. Now this is very hard to figure, and it's actually very hard to draw. So I'm going to try, but I'm probably going to make a mistake. Oh no! Wait a second. It was this case here. So along this direction, right? When is the? Oh wait a second. Let, let's put them even closer. Better. Yeah. We put them even closer here, and this is the direction of movement, all right? Along this direction, what happens? That 
this is the, the, the speed sigma is something like this, right? And we seem indeed to have a collision here, right? And this collision is going to be at some time during the frame. On this other direction though, the collision happens much sooner. So you seem to have a collision here. But the distance, the amount of time it takes to do this collision and to do this collision is not the same. So this collision starts after you've done, say, half a frame, and this collision starts much sooner. So you have two separating axes. It looks like there's a collision on both the axes, but the collision on one axis happens after the collision on the other axis is done. So you don't really have a collision. All right? Yep. Don't, you, don't you mean that you don't have a collision on one of the separating axes? <coughs> no, it means that you don't have a collision. You don't have an actual collision. What you need to make sure of is that the time, the, the interval of time when the collision begins and ends here and here, the interval of time is the same. So you need to have a collision on all potential separating axes, but at the same time. Because if one axis seems to collide, but the other is not, then the other, for f during the first collision, then the other is a separating axis. But then, for the rest of the frame, the second axis stops being a separating axis because you have a collision there, but you have a, collision, uh, a separating axis, uh, another separating axis. So, this is actually rather unintuitive, but the point is, you cannot just reason in terms of a single separating axis. So a single separating axis, uh, so all separating axis failures can still mean there is no collision if the collisions are not at the same time. So what we do now is we track t first and t last, which are t first, the minimum begin time of a collision. So if you have delta x, then you can easily find out when this collision started and you, you can see when you start overlapping by checking SD and when you stop overlapping by checking this other distance so you check the minimum separating distance and you check the maximum separating distance you find the time when you start the collision and the time when you end the collision on every axis and for every potential separating direction D you check the interval and you see if, with respect to the interval and with respect to the current speed, this is sigma, if there is no intersection. If there is no intersection, then this is a proper separating axis, so we simply say there is no collision. But otherwise, we actually, no intersect actually sees if along this axis, the, the time when the collision begins and the time when the collision ends get updated. So t first and t last are actually written by no intersect. And they contain the minimum uh, the maximum time of beginning of a collision and the minimum time of ending of a collision. We do all the tests. Now wait a second. And there is a piece missing. I'm going to fix this. Before returning true, you check if t first is smaller than t last. And in this case, still return false. So you check to see if indeed after all the separating axes seem to fail the test, you still had the situation where one of the tests uh, were, were two separating axes were indeed, <coughs> well, let's say jagged. Okay. All right. Well, this we've seen already. Oh, and this is the way we check for the no intersection. So we do a series of, essentially a series of tests to check all the possible relationships between the minimum and the maximum, because this is the maximum and this is the minimum, but they may also be swapped. So this may be the maximum and this may be the minimum. So you do all the tests. You see, of course, if the speed projected on the axis is smaller than zero and you already have a separation, you stop. Otherwise, you check to see the, the, the first time of, uh, of collision and the last time of collision along this axis. And the moment you find that the first time a collision is bigger than the last, you can safely say that you have separating axes that collide at different times, non-intersecting different intervals of time. So you can actually 
just skip the rest of the collision. You know for a fact that the objects are not colliding. Uh, and yeah, you do the same for maximum minimum versus minimum maximum. The, the two tests are absolutely symmetrical. And essentially this is it. And this is a bit hard to grasp, especially the fact that you cannot just factor in the velocity along a single axis. So the most important thing is that the velocity along a single axis does not mean anything by itself. You actually need to check the interval of time of intersection of all the possible axes. So you have additional ways of thinking you have a collision but not having it. So you may have that all the separating axis tests are not failed separating axis tests, so you would think there is a collision, but in reality there isn't, because the failures are at different times. All right, now we take a break. Hard it is to explain this thing. Now when I first yeah, Nick, Nick, had you echt een andere tand moeten komen. Uh, when I first encountered this explanation, <laughs> um, well, yeah. I didn't really yeah. find any explanation. I just found formulas on a very important book, which is the Game Physics for Game Programmers by David Everly. All right? And I thought, well, usually this guy goes to great lengths to explain stuff, but he's not really explaining that very much. There wasn't any pictures, any explanations. It was just uh, the, the T first and T last check. And then I decided, okay, but, well, the school is always paying for physics books, so I bought a collision detection book just to look for the explanation to this. And to my greatest dread, there was no explanation again. <laughs> formula. So what do I do? What do you do in these cases? You go to the GDC website and you download all the physics presentations for the last 10 years. If you, you have a code. Can you imagine how many of those featured the, the explanation of this little bit here? How many? Zero. 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 Exactly. <laughs> so at that point I was, yeah, kind of depressed. Uh, and ready to just remove the moving test from the course. So um, I kept searching and yes, there was a paper from 1989 where this thing first was explained, which had kind of an explanation, right? But the explanation was very long and very convoluted. So what happened is that this explanation is so, is so, so, so unintuitive that everyone is just saying, okay, just do it like this. This is like the, the grandma's recipe. Just do it like this. It's going to come out fine. And no one really explains it. So it's kind of like the explanation is lost in the lore of game physics engine development. But so that's the reason why it took me so long to actually figure out a decent example. But the decent example is this one. So you have this object here, and you have this other object here, okay? And the relative velocity is this, okay? Let's consider two separating axes. This separating axis here, and this other one, okay? Right? Now. Along this direction, the first collision occurs at what time? Zero. Zero. Okay, so in this case we have a potential T first, which is equal to zero. And when does the collision end? You can still project, you, you can see, the, you, you know that it's moving in this direction, so you know when the end interval is going to be outside, so you know when this point here will get here. That gives you how long the, you take the distance, you know the sigma, you know the speed, so you can derive the time of ending, which we call T last. Is it clear what T last is? It's the time when the two intervals, so T first is when the two intervals start touching, <coughs> T last is when the two intervals stop touching, right? So when the two objects stop intersecting along this axis. Let's say the T last is, well, after a bit, but not that much actually. So when T last happens, the object has been has arrived here. Let's say the T last is, I don't know, 0.5, just inventing a number, okay? On this separating direction, on the other hand, when does the collision start? It starts when the object, has, when this point here has arrived here, right? So, this is the other T first, the T first for this axis. And when does the collision end? When this projection, the point here, arrives here. And this is T last. Now this T first is probably going to be something, well, 
Is it going to be bigger than 0 0.5 or not? It is, right? Okay, so it's something like 1.5, seems, seems reasonable, right? And TLAST is going to be at least bigger than 1.5, right? So I don't know, TLAST is going to be equal to 2. <coughs> Alright? So, what we know is that we have two axes then, and there seems to be a collision on both axes, right? But interval of the time of the collisions is in one case 0 through 0 0.5, and in the other case it's 1.5 through 2.0 and these time intervals are not colliding so we have two apparent collisions which are not real collisions when we find out that this is the case for two axes then we can safely say that there is no collision because we have absolutely certainly identified the k this case so we can stop the collision detection as soon as we find one axis has this kind of t first and t last another one has this kind of t first and t last and we can say no there is no collision even though we have found two axes along which there appears to be a collision all right so this is the biggest difference between this side the moving test and the non-moving test and what we really do is we take the maximum t first and the minimum t last and we compare them and if the minimum t last is smaller than the maximum t first, then you have this case here. Right? So now you know how to roughly derive the example. You start the object's line, and you make one move below, so that the collision, the, the, the first collision happens right away, and the second one happens in the rel relatively distant future. Okay? Now, of <coughs> course, uh, be mindful, because you must also clamp all those cases when t first is smaller than delta time <coughs> and same goes for t last our wires are checking for collisions any time in the future we don't care you only care about collisions within the current frame so if a collision is in 20 seconds well okay you don't care otherwise you always say that there's no collision which is, is risky so you always have to restrict yourselves to the cases within to the t first and t last mm -hmm within the current delta time. Alright? Is it better now? No, I'm not bad. So, now comes the hard part. You have fun. Yeah, right. This, this feels horrible to say, but that is the case. So, uh, we have found out that yes, there is a collision. The separating axis test has said that yes, there is a collision. Whether it's a moving collision or a static collision, it doesn't matter. There is one. Now what do we need to find is the points of collision. Where is the collision happening? And depending on what you want to be able to do with your collision response system. Now a collision response system is capable usually of dealing with lots of uh, contact points. You can have a very good set of contact points, which allows you to do stacking, etc. Or you can have a weaker set of contact points, which only allows you to resolve collisions. Okay? So there is a very broad spectrum of things you want to do. If you want to be able to achieve stacking, for example, which is a bit of a holy grail, then and you have two objects, like one small cube on top of another one, then you need to find all of these contact points, right? Because otherwise, if you find, for example, only these three, then the object is going to fall on fourth, or may, be fall, may fall on fourth. But on the other hand, if you just have moving stuff that you can throw around the level, and you just want to make sure that they don't really get into each other, but you don't just care about stable stacking or this kind of stuff, then you don't really care. And if the object is moving, then you probably just care to find a single vertex here. Right? Okay. Now, a collision response system that's good as the one that we're going to talk about can deal with all these cases in the same manner. Okay. And how do you find the points that you care about? You just hack a bunch of tests. 
<laughs> yeah, this is a, a big downer, right? So essentially, what you, do, you, you know how to do clipping. You know how to do intersections between edges and triangles, edges and polygons. Do you know how to do these things? You know how to do clipping. Who knows how to do clipping? Seriously? I think they're just cutting out my right face. Then you'll know how to do clipping very soon. Uh, I think. I'm not sure. But basically, what you do is a bunch of geometrical tests until you identify all the points you're interested into. And this is the way I perceive this. This is very iterative process. So you keep adding tests and you try to get away with as little and as simple tests. Little code and simple code means usually fast code, easy to maintain and debug. If you need more, then you go and do more. All right? And you just try to identify interesting points. It may be, for example, that a case like this one, where you have a box on top of another, all right, that just these points are fine for what you need to do. Or you, it may be the case that you also need to find points here. Okay. Or it may be that, yeah, you really want to solve very well this case, so you need to find points here and this other point here on the same one, instead of just finding this, uh, instead of just finding this point. Everything's fine. Depends very heavily on your scenario. <coughs> you can go from very simple to very complicated. Now, one note is that there is lots... So, this means that, essentially, as rough approximation, every physics engine can, in line of principle, have a different way, a different actual algorithm for determining the collision detection, the, the, the collision points. Uh, well, if we're working with SAT, then you usually do a bunch of intuitive tests, which is my, my personal favorite. But there's alternatives. GJK is very much used as well, together with SAT, and it, do, it does at the same time the collision detection and the determination of the contact points at the same time. So GJK is used by some people. So there is also completely different ways to respond to the question of is there a collision and uh, where is the collision on the shoe bodies. But for now, we'll, for the course, we'll, we'll just limit ourselves to an extension, uh, an intuitive extension to SAT. So, uh, when we find the intersection, when we find an intersection, the separating axis test now can return not only the fact that there is an intersection, but also the minimum time t first of the intersection, right? Because we know what's the, sorry, the, yeah, the minimum t first of the intersection. So now we know when the collision starts, when the collision actually happens. We can also know the separating direction <coughs> and whether it's an, uh, an edge cross product or it's the face of an, of, of an edge, right? So we know that there is a collision across this face here. So this is one body and this is the other body. All right, so we know that the separating direction came from this face, this reference point, and we also know that this is the point that we found to be inside the other body. All right, so we track a bunch of information. Uh, of course, this may also be the velocity, uh, the, 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 the other position moved by the velocity with respect to the time of, of start of collision, but I'll just ignore this for the moment. What we do is we need to find an approximation of the set of points that are in contact. We have two possible cases, remember, in 3D. So in 2D, this is the only possible case. We have one face against one vertex. The vertex that lost the case, the, the vertex of the extreme of the interval that was found to be intersecting. Uh, and we pick the one that's intersecting the least, because if you have a collision, you have a collision along across all the possible separating directions. So we keep the one where the intersection, where the overlap, is the smallest. S is it clear why we need to pick the smallest? If we have a collision, we have a collision over all the directions. So over this direction, we have a collision as well. But which one is more interesting? Why is the first more interesting? So when the separating axis test fails and tells us that, yes, there is a collision, the collision is over all the potential separating directions. The first task we have is we have to pick the most interesting. Do we pick a random one? No, absolutely not. We have to pick one in particular. Yeah? Did you raise your hand? No. no. What if we 
we pick the, the long one, the second one? What does the collision response? What's the collision response system tr going to try to do, presumably? It's going to try to push the object out of the other one along the long direction. Would you rather this object gets pushed out from here or from there? <coughs> yeah? Does the velocity of the other object matter? No, it doesn't. Okay. Yeah? Is it on the axis which collides the most? It is on the separate direction where the overlap is the smallest. We want the smallest overlap because it means that the collision response system will be able to push the objects away along the smallest distance because you, d you want to resolve the smallest possible constraint, the smallest possible violation of the interpenetration, the no interpenetration constraint, with the least amount of work possible. Otherwise, the collision response system, if you pick this direction, the collision response system is going to say, okay, you should be in this, co in this situation. But seriously, we want to be in this one, right? Do you strongly agree with this? Yeah. Or do you want your objects to... So you have one cube falling on another one in this direction, it touches here, and boom, it gets moved here. Awesome. Right? You don't want this. You assume that this is the first one that happened. So this is kind of about the velocity, because you assume that the smallest interpenetration is the one that, that happened the, 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 the last. All right? So we find the separating direction, <coughs> which is violated the least. How much is this violated? A missing letter there. And oh, in this case. Okay, yeah. Right? This is how much this is violated. Actually, you should probably take uh, the absolute value or the, or the negative value because you're violating the constraint so this value is going to be negative if you want to pick the smallest violation then of course the smallest is an absolute value otherwise the smallest is going to be the one with the, the, the smallest negative value which is indeed the wrong one okay so we as a starting point we can identify easily enough the phase where the violation is the smallest okay and this is our starting point. So this is what comes out of the collision detection algorithm. Alternative, and this is the phase to vertex case. Alternatively, we may have the edge to edge case. All right? In that case, in that case, it's actually easier. So this one is the one that we'll work on. The edge to edge case. After careful and deliberate testing, my personal experience, I decided that it's actually not that important. So you can collapse the... When you find an edge-to-edge -edge collision, you approximate that with a face-to-vertex collision. And from my experience, it seems to give rather good results. But, yeah, wouldn't... Yeah, I would actually bet on it. Okay. So, uh, what we do is we, we start from a face, and we call it the reference face. So let's draw this again. This face here where we found the separating direction <coughs> and this other thing here where we found the violating vertex and we have the reference point here this space here, F we call it the reference face <coughs> right? now, we can't just work with a single vertex because we, we need more so we need to find the incident face which is the other face on the other body or we do the uh, against which we do the the, the 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 collision area determination. By the way, uh, the the area of collision, the volume of collision, so this volume here is called the contact manifold. If you really want to get technical, even though this doesn't really change anything besides the fact that if you want to Google how to compute this, well, you better use the right term. So, what phase do we want? Do we want F two or do we want F three? Is yeah. the, the manifold, is that the, the shape or the complete? It's the complete volume intersection. The, com the complete volume. It is the complete volume. Okay. But it doesn't really change that much. No, but just in case I'm looking it up on the internet and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. So, what phase do we want? F2 or F3? And why? Huh. Yeah. Perhaps both. Both! Why not both? 
How many faces can a single vertex share in 3D? Lots. The answer is just lots. All right? Yeah. Do you want them all? No. No, exactly. So first choice, we just try to pick a reasonable one and hopefully we'll be fine. <laughs> also, because if you have too many, then the collision response system will risk pushing in a direction where you don't really want any pushing. So pushing only away so that you, that you, you pick two faces that are intersecting somehow and then you solve the constraint. So if you pick F2, what's going to happen is that V is going to, so we're kind of going to rotate around this point and what's going to happen is that instead of doing having this, you'll now have this, right? And this is F2. So the end result should be that F2 now becomes parallel to F where they weren't before. But if you pick F3, then what you do, okay, I'll, I'll draw this here again. If you pick F3, now what's going to happen is that F3 is pushed out. So you'll get something like this. It's still fine, and this is now F3. Because you, you just push out. You don't really rotate around. So well, what happens is that, well, you can pick both, but which one do you like most? But yeah? why did you rotate it? Around the, the, on the left one and on the right Because this, was, uh, this, this point is inside. Okay. So you're rotating around the closest point of, 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 of intersection. Oh, yeah, which in. Oh, sorry. Yeah. In this case, you're right, actually. In this case, it would still be very similar, but it would be on this side. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. But the biggest point is that here, the, so this one has rotated far more. So presumably the object fell here, and if we pick F2, it falls like this and it goes back up. If we pick F3, it falls like this and then it rotates inside, all right? So which face did we pick? Yeah? And that's most uh, perpendicular to the... Perpendicular to the... To the normal. Oh, so the, the one that's the most parallel, uh, so you pick the two most parallel faces. To the yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That actually makes perfect sense, because this way you actually try to find the faces that are the closest, <coughs> and the adjustment is going to be the smallest, right? So we try, we assume that because we're still doing a, we're, we're doing a simulation, an approximation of actual physics. So what we try to do is we try to resolve the constraints, the constraint violations, with as little violation of the physics laws as possible. So in this case, we have two objects that are getting into each other. This is not acceptable, of course. But do we push them a lot or a little? We try to push them as little as possible. So this is the same reason why we picked F as face, because the penetration was the smallest. And now we pick F2 because it's the one that's the most parallel. So it's the best candidate to be pushed and become fully parallel and be outside of the original face. So F2 as D2, which is it's normal. What we want is two faces which are as close to having their norm normals completely opposite, right? So we want the, the other face, so we have F, and the other face is going to be picked as which one? How do we compute the most parallel other face? Yeah. You dot the normals, okay, and you pick. The one? One close to zero. No, we got to the greatest line. No? We we're getting closer? <laughs> Which one do we want? Uh, the one with the dot product of minus one. The one where the dot product is as close as possible to minus one. Which we're never gonna get, so we pick the smallest one. We pick the face with the small which normal has the smallest dot product. The smallest dot product is going to be the one closest to this situation. So the dot product between D and D2 in this case is minus 1. In uh, this case it's going to be, I don't know, minus 0 0.9, 0 0.8, whatever. In this case it would be 0, we don't really care. And in this case it would be 1. Alright? So we don't want the case of 1, absolutely not, because otherwise we go and pick this space here, the worst possible candidate. So you now push the object inside and you're actually going to get a collision <coughs> response system which pushes the object as inside and as neatly as possible, one inside the other. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, you, uh, you'll see that plenty, trust me, when you do the assignment. Uh, it's horrible. It breaks your heart. I mean, 
And that usually means that you've done everything kind of right. <laughs> it's a feature. <laughs> yeah, it's a feature. You, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we so we and we call the other phase incident phase. Oh, this concept of uh, of the dot product being as close as possible to minus one is also called uh, of the two phases uh, the two phases of being anti-parallel. The two phases are anti-parallel because they are parallel, but their normals are opposite, right? So if they have the normals together, the, if the normals dot to one, then the phases are parallel. But if the normals dot to minus one, then they're anti-parallel. They're still parallel, but watching in different directions. Okay, what we do now is we clip the incident phase against the edges of the reference phase. It sounds like an, an, an awfully evil thing to say, but, okay, so first of all, this is the starting situation. You see we pick this one because it's more in line with, with this phase, right? So we, we, we start from this vertex and we check all the faces that, that, that share this vertex and we pick the one where the dot product is the smallest, all right? Yep. Why not just take the vertex normal? The vertex normal. You can, oh, you could stop. You could just say, okay, this vertex fails. We just use this vertex for the collision response system. That's it. You can. It's, once it's acceptable, because you will get very weird results, especially because you may also get this case. So you have fun. You push this vertex to, to solve the collision. The, this is still, the collision response system is probably going to find a way to solve this. But, yeah, good luck. So, that's the reason we go with the faces. And, and we can't really stop there. So, we take the edges, which in this case, well, th this is a cube, so the edges go into the screen. And we compute the planes that go from the edges away towards the normal of the face. Right? And we clip. So you see, this was the cube before. This was the cube before. You see, then we take the projections upward with respect to the normal. So we're not talking about this phase. We're talking about this edge away from the normal. And we cut only the incident phase. So we take this point because it's inside. And we cut here because there is the intersection between an edge of the incident phase and the original phase. Oh, sorry. <coughs> My apologies. You actually... Oh, come on. <laughs> sorry. We can also... No, oh, they're not aligned. Or alternatively, yes, we can just pick this one and consider this as an alternate edge to compare against this one. There's plenty of choices, actually. You can decide what to clip as long as you are in this magic area here, defined as the points of the incident phase, which are very close to the reference phase and inside the, the, the edges. What you really want to do is you want to make sure that if you have another vertex here, you don't work with a vertex that, that's outside of the projection of the reference phase. Because otherwise you push in the wrong direction. You could argue. And this is actually what I've done in, in my implementation. But this point is even more interesting. And indeed you can find it. The way we find these points is all with a bunch of geometric checks. Oh, which we'll see in a second. Now the last case we were not talking about was uh, the edge-to-edge -edge intersection. So not when we have a face against the vertex, but rather when we have an edge against an edge. So the separating direction is the cross product between two, edge norm two edges stretch directions. In that case, that is potentially the easiest case. You have two edges touching, something like this. Yeah, where it has to be rotated. But this this is an edge, right? So in this case, just find the collision point between edge and edge, and this is the only collision point you care about. Because they're just the two objects are just balancing at the point of contact between two edges. So you don't care really uh, about finding lots of, of complex uh, intersection uh, contact manifolds. 
just need them to be pushed out and if something more interesting has to happen then this collision detection after you resolve it and you push it out will turn into a face to vertex um, a face to vertex uh, intersection so the only int really interesting case is the face against vertex intersection the edge to edge case is very important to check for that otherwise you miss collisions so you have to check for it but you may also not not do anything and collapse it to a face to vertex intersection or just find the, the intersection between the edges and you're fine. Okay, so now let's see exactly in a face to vertex case uh, how do we do the, the actual geometric tests to determine the contact manifold. Now first of all, how many vertices are we looking for? Well, one may say as many as I can, so I pick all the incident faces uh, as you said before but then you get lots of pushes from the collision response system in different directions. So this is not an ideal case. So it may seem intuitively that the more information you give to the collision response system, the better. But no, this is false. You need to give the collision response system the right information. And the right information is two vertices, which usually are enough to gain some degree of stability in 2D, or three vertices in 3D. Four is better. When you start getting five, six, eight vertices to, to the collision response system, you will get strange results. Okay. So as soon as you find the right amount of points, you stop checking. Uh, if you have too many vertices, well, we choose the ones that are penetrating the most, because these are the worst violators of the non-penetration constraint. So we tell the collision response system, solve me these mistakes. Of course, you pick the most. Otherwise, if you pick the ones that are colliding the least, then what's going to happen is that the collision response system is going to resolve those, but it's not going to resolve the ones that are penetrating a lot. So if you really have to decide between these two points, then yeah, this is better. This one is the one you have to choose for. All right. And this is an example of indeed another good contact <coughs> manifold. So we started with the reference phase. This is its normal. We find the most antiparallel phase. We cut the antiparallel phase along the projections of the edges. So this is the cut that we get. And you can see already that if we choose these two points, then this is a very good situation because we, we have two points and we can use them to balance very neatly. So if we push these points up, then we get a very nice and very balanced situation after the collision response system. This is a very reasonable choice. Even though it remains, it is and it remains essentially a very well thought heuristic. How do we do the clipping in intersections? Well, first thing we need to be able to do is we need to be able to clip an edge of the incident face against the projected edges of the reference face. So, this is the reference face. This is the incident phase. We compute these planes and we check for the intersection with the incident phase. So what we want to get out is this portion here of the incident phase. So first of all, is it clear what we're computing? <coughs> okay. Now, step one. Oh yeah, and all the vertices so the first thing we do is we check all the vertices of the incident phase and we see if they're all inside the planes. What do you know about <coughs> vertices being inside planes? To whom does this sound familiar? Raise your hand. Okay. I dare say that's not enough to consider the classroom confident to the topic. Yeah, probably focuses on doing rasterization. Yeah, th this is... Yeah, was block two. Oh, yeah. okay. Have you done uh, first one calling yet? No. Who has? In, uh, in th year one, at least when we were first years, there's no real semblance of 3D, 3D oh, courses, okay. only in the yeah. second year. So let's discuss this. So, this is an edge. And we want to find a plane. How many vertices does, does an edge have? Come on, guys, seriously. How many vertices does an edge have? Two. Two, very good. So this is probably going to go, I don't know, something like this, right? If we're completing. We want to find this plane here, right? So let's call these vertices A and B. 
Uh, let's get another vertex. I don't know. Let's find another vertex along uh, in the plane. How do we? Come on. A and B are vertices in the plane, right? And all vertices have to be along N with respect to A and B. So can we just do, I don't know, can I just take C equal to B plus N? Is this in the plane? This, this is in the plane. Okay, so a plane is defined, a plane in 3D, as the normal of the plane, which we call n prime, and the distance along the normal from the origin. So if the origin is here, then this is the plane, it goes infinitely, it extends, it is a plane, so it's rather big. So we project against the normal and the distance from the plane to the origin, which we can call D, is the second <coughs> value that we track for the plane. So a plane is a normal perpendicular to the surface of the plane and the distance. Now, be very mindful because the normal may also be this one. That is, this, we are talking about the same plane but watching from the outside of the uh, of, uh, from from the outside <coughs> of the body, all right? The most important it doesn't matter which ones you pick, as long as all the planes you compute from your edges all point outward or all point inward with respect to the body, all right? So all the planes have to be computed and built in the same manner. That is why all the face all the edges have to be either clockwise or counterclockwise with respect to their uh, to the, the to, to, to their polygon to their current polygon. Otherwise, you get some planes that look outward, some planes that look inward, and you cannot use them. This is a horrible and very hard to debug source of problems. Okay, so make sure that all the normals watch outwards or inwards, and we'll go for inwards. It is an arbitrary choice. I absolutely don't care either way. So, we have a point, we have this point here, P. We want to know its distance from the plane. How do we compute this? We have done this like a thousand times yet. <coughs> Sorry? <coughs> Projected on the plane, along what? The plane normal. Okay, so we could, for example, do p dot n prime minus t. This is the distance between the point and the plane. Okay, now if the point is on this side of the plane, the distance is going to be positive. If the point is on this side of the plane, the distance is going to be negative. Negative, of course. So, when is this point inside the projection of the face. When it's positive. Yes, when the but is positive. When, when it's, the distance is positive with respect to all the planes built from all the edges. So you check all the edges and if it's inside all of them then the point is inside the plane. You can look at, if you look at this from, from the top you have this point here, this is P, and the planes are here, 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 and here. They go inside the whiteboard. If, so if this distance is positive, and this distance is positive, and this distance is positive, and this distance is positive, then you are inside. But if only one of those is negative, for example, the point is here, then yeah, this is positive, yeah, this is positive, yeah, this is positive, but no. This one here is negative, because you're outside the bottom plane. So if you find a single plane such that your distance from that plane is negative, then the point is outside, and we don't care. And the first thing we do is we find all the vertices such that their projection is inside the extensions, is clipped by the edges of the reference space. 
So, if we have this situation here, this point goes inside, but this point is outside. So we do not keep this point as a contact point. All right? We could stop here. Ideally, you can just do this. So you just clip the, the points of the incident face, the vertices of the incident face, against the edges of the reference face. And that already gives you a valid set of contact points. We, depressingly evil potential situation, such as this one, Yeah. So, is any of the vertices? So let's say this is the incident phase, and this is the reference phase. Is any of the point of the vertices of the incident phase clipped inside? No. So the collision, your collision detection system in this case is going to say yes, there is a collision. Then you're going to look for points. You're going to find none. You're going to faithfully tell the collision response system that no, that there is no points to solve. Mm -hmm. And what are the objects going to do? They're going to sadly fall one into each other, okay? So you'll watch them as they <laughs> fall. So you move the object, maybe first you have the vertices, the ver vertices correctly positioned, then you move them and then they start falling into each other. And so the heart breaks. And the heart breaks, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so, we can't really stop. Oh yes, this is how you clip, oh, this is how you clip a vertex. Oh yeah, my, my art is always so basically, the dot product between the point position and normal, you subtract d, which is the distance along the normal between the plane and the origin. You subtract the distance, and you get this piece here, which is the distance between the point and the uh, b between the point and the plane. Okay. Now, yeah, we've done it. So then, we have to do something else. We have to see. We have to find intersections now between the edges and the planes because these points here are not vertices but they are points of intersection between edges and planes can you see this? so if you cut along this plane here this edge here, you get this point if you cut this edge here against this plane here you get this point and so forth. So, and so the second test that we really must be able to do is checking an edge against a plane. And you can apply this test as many times as you want. You can apply the test against the clipping planes, which are this one, this one, this one, and this one. You can also use the reference space as a plane itself and clip the edges, which is once again a very, value, uh, a very valid option. And it can arise the case where you need to. But they all are the same test, and the test is edge against plane. So, you do know <coughs> that you have a plane, and the plane is characterized by its normal direction and its distance from the origin. You have an edge which goes from A to B. So this is expressed as a linear interpolation with a free parameter alpha, which is between 0 and 1. When alpha is 0, then you're talking about the first vertex, A. When alpha is 1, you're talking about the second vertex, A plus B. And when alpha is 0 0.5, you're talking about the middle of the edge. What you want to find is a point that is along the edge, which is also on the plane. So you have two equations, you, you, you put them together, you have a system and, and you solve. And this is actually very easy to, to determine. Alpha is equal to D minus the start <coughs> of, the, uh, the, of the edge the normal of the plane, and the direction of the edge. If alpha is greater or equal to zero, and smaller or equal than one, you have found the intersection between uh, the face and the, between a pl the plane and the edge. Okay? This is actually very, very simple. And at this point, you just recombine what you have seen so far, and you find all, only the points you are interested in. There is not a single recipe. You can keep doing. You can check all the, inc the possible incident faces. And you can check all the possible edges of all the possible incident faces. Against, uh, uh, you can clip them against the, 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 the reference face. Uh, you can clip them against just the reference plane. You can do plenty of stuff. Of course, the more information you gather, the heavier the contact manifold determination is going to become. 
That is why there is not a single answer to this problem. But the only answer is you have to be able to do checks of plane against vertex and plane against edge. These are the two things you need to know. With these, you can derive the most complex contact manifold determination algorithms that you need. Alright? And you need both of them, because otherwise, if you don't do the edge against uh, against plane, then you lose this kind of this kind of uh, this kind of chess, uh, this kind of check. Oh, be mindful, because when you check when you clip an edge against a plane, if the plane and the edge are parallel, there is no collision possible. If the if this is the edge, and this is the plane, <coughs> then well. Yeah, they are almost perpendicular, so the direction of the edge and the normal of the plane are almost perpendicular, so the dot product <coughs> is almost zero, and indeed, this fraction is not a fraction, because you're trying to divide by zero. So pay a lot of attention. This is, I think, the only thing to, to pay attention to. And the rest, you just keep trying and ending checks until you are confident enough that you have found all the points you care for. All right, and the result usually becomes that if this was your reference phase and the bigger one is your incident phase, you clip against these two planes, you find the point, you clip against the reference phase itself and what you find is this point here, which is, which can be, which is then, uh, well, you can say this is the perfect answer. This is exactly what we were looking for, okay? And this, this is all done by clipping. You just clip vertices and edges against planes. Yeah, all right. You can also do the edge-to-edge -edge intersection if you really want. But the, first of all, the intersection is, well, you have to approximate that. If you really want to, you, can, you, you can't really find the intersection because usually when you have two edges in 3D, they do not intersect. They just get very close. In 3D, it's very, very, very hard for two edges to intersect. So what you do is you look for the closest pair of points and you, you just try to find a connecting axis that's perpendicular to both edges and so on. But the derivation of this solution is very long, very tedious, and from my personal experience, it's not really needed. So you can have it for completion, for completeness, but you can also just skip it. And for the assignment, that would be my advice. And even for an actual physics engine, you can use just the, the, the if you do good enough clipping of faces versus vertices, then your faces against the vertices and the edges of the incident face will give you a result that is very similar to this one without having to add a separate check. So just consider this. Okay, which leads us to an assignment. <laughs> the assignment is before the end of next Friday, so not this Friday, before the end of the next one, a collision detection system based on separating axis test with some contact manifold determination. You can determine as many points as you want, as, as long as you find at least one in, in simple cases, uh, and you don't need to do the moving test, right? You can also just do the static test. My advice would be allow uh, the user to move and rotate shapes in 3D and to see through wireframe or whatever the contact points that you have found in a very clear manner, okay? All right. <coughs> Shall we take another break? Yep. Oh, uh, well, there is a question. Yeah. Uh, Rubrics again, the shape drop or color, or just the, uh, this image? No, that is kind of pointless. No, uh, just uh, an archive. Okay. RAR or zip. Yeah. Yeah, originally the sentence was group work CD in my vision hole, which then became in the shared Dropbox folder, <laughs> and that kind of stuck. <laughs> All right. Break, indeed? Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.